dizygotic twins, that's where we ended up last time. And we just saw a video about the early stages of embryogenesis. So uh, the early stages, including cleavage, where a morula is formed, and then a blastulation, where a blastula is formed with a blastocele cavity, and gastrulation, where the three germ layers are formed, the um, ectoderm, which ectoderm will eventually become uh, skeletal tissue and nervous tissue, for example, and skin. A mesoderm, which is the middle layer that will eventually become muscle tissue. And the inner layer is endoderm, which will become part of the gastrointestinal system and organs. So, but for now, differentiation has only been into these three different kinds of cells. So it's the blastocyst that implants into the uterine wall um, about six days after ovulation. So here's our blastocyst and the cavities here, blastocele. Uh, the trophoblast is the outer layer of cells and the embryoblast is the collection of cells that's been pushed to one side here. So here is the uh, endometrial epithelium, the outer layer of the uterus, um, capillary, gland. And the mass that grows into the um, endometrium is called the synchytiotrophoblast. Yeah, nice long word. It's multinucleate and it kind of grows roots. So they're cells that the um, cells divide, but they divide in a particular direction. So in this case, they're dividing into the endometrium in a particular direction. Um, they kind of digest their way. So the the endometrium provides some nutrition for these cells. So up until now, the ball of cells really isn't that much bigger than the initial zygote. So the zygote had all that cytoplasm and was able to provide for all of the daughter cells up to now. Uh, but the endometrium has provided some nutrition as well, the uh, milking of the endometrium. And now as the cells start to digest their way into the endometrium. And they secrete a hormone. So these cells secrete uh, the human choreogonic gonadotropin hormone, and that stimulates the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum will continue to secrete hormones um, in order to prevent menstruation. So this, uh, the human chorionic, chorio, the human chorionic Canadotropin is detectable by a urine test kit. And that will become the chorion. The chorion. And I'll show you that in a moment. It's a, a layer that forms. And eventually the endometrium completely encloses the embryo that is implanting itself. So as we saw in embryogenesis, the uh, blastomeres, the, the cells of the embryoblast, will form the three primary germ layers. And we know those to be um, ectodermal, endodermal, and mesodermal. So the amniotic cavity forms between the embryoblast and the cytotrophoblast. The cytotrophoblast is the inner layer of the, um, the synchiotrophoblast, <laughs> I can't even say. Um, and it flattens, the, the embryoblast uh, flattens into an embryonic disc. And that's formed from ectodermal and endodermal cells. So this is another diagram showing what the Kahn diagram showed, but in a 
slightly different perspective. So these are the germ layers. The ectoderm here is in blue, the mesoderm is in red, and the endoderm is green. And there is still a yolk sac. The cells sink into the primitive streak, that's the groove here. And they spread as the mesoderm layer. And there's some gelatinous tissue, the meso mesenchyme cells. So at two weeks, here's the conceptus that's implanted. It's surrounded by a couple of membranes, the chorion, and these are all membranes that are part of an, um, an amniote. So reptiles, um, amphibians, mammals, we are amniotes and therefore we can have um, embryos on land. Before that with fishes and other invertebrates, um, eggs were laid in water and fertilized there and grew in water. But in order to in order to grow an embryo on land, it has to be surrounded by water still. It has to be suspended and be able to exchange gases and obviously nutrients. So therefore the development of the chorion uh, is part of the amnio amniotic um, egg, including the amniotic cavity, which is here, um, the amnion layer, And I'll show you what happens to all of these various layers. Um, so we have our germ layers. Well, something that can occur is called an ectopic pregnancy, where the blastocyst implants somewhere other than the uterus. Uh, approximately one out of 300 pregnancies. Most cases occur in a uterine tube that's called a tubal pregnancy. Um, there could be an obstruction, for example, in the tube from some kind of inflammation or from uh, previous abortions or perhaps tubal surgery. So the tube doesn't expand enough uh, and can rupture. Uh, it can actually be uh, quite dangerous. It must be seen to um, quite quickly. But interestingly, the conceptive Conceptus can re-implant in the ab abdomenopelvic cavity, somewhere where it finds an adequate blood supply. Usually it does require an abortion, but interestingly, 9% of abdominal pregnancies result in live birth by cesarean section. So in human development, the embryonic stage weeks are called weeks two to nine. So that's when all three germ layers are present. Uh, the conceptus forms a set of membranes that are external to the embryo. And at this stage, the embryo starts to receive nutrients from the placenta, from the placenta. And the germ layers differentiate into the organs and organ systems that they are to become. So where does all the nutrition come from? Originally, these are the weeks here after implantation, zero, 40. So for about the first 12 weeks or so, there's uh, a, quite a large contribution from a trophoblast, those are the outer cells, and that tapers off and is taken over by placental nutrition. So that is kind of a slow taking over of the nutrition provided to the growing embryo. So for trophoblastic nutrition, the conceptus is nourished, conceptus or is nourished by digestion of the endometrial cells in the first eight weeks. And progesterone stimulates the deciduous cells of the uterus. So those are cells that are available in the uterus. And placental nutrition is the conceptus is nourished from the mother's blood th stream through the placenta. So let's see what happens uh, with the formation of the placenta. Placentation. It occurs from about 11 days to 12 weeks. 
And the villi, the chorionic villi, those are extensions of the synchytiotrophoblast into the endometrium by digestion and root. So those are called chorionic villi because, and you know, they kind of look like the villi of the, um, of the intestines. Yeah, that we saw when we were looking at tissue. And the mesenchyme, which is um, 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 kind of loose cells in uh, loose connective tissue, extend into the chorionic villi and they form the embryonic blood vessels. Uh, placental sinus forms, which is, are pools of maternal blood, they merge and surround the villi. And the blood stimulates rapid growth of the embryonic or the chorionic villi. So here are the stages of placental development. So I basically wanted to show you the end stage, mostly. So it's important to note that the um, embryonic and maternal blood, they don't, they don't mix, or rather they are separate and nutrients and gases diffuse. They diffuse from the maternal vessels to the uh, embryonic vessels through, um, and are transported in the umbilical cord. So there are umbilical blood vessels. So the chorionic ones are shown here in blue. So they go out here and form these villi, the chorionic villi here. And that is where they exchange gases and nutrients with this pool of uh, maternal blood. Let's take a look at some of the membranes. So with a lot of uh, organisms like birds, for example, and reptiles, nutrition comes from the yolk, from the yolk. In human embryos, the nutrition comes from the um, endometrial cells initially, and then from the placenta from the mother. So this is just looking at the whole thing a little bit more closely here that we looked at before. So you, here, it, this is a little bit better because you can see um, the maternal blood here. Um, yeah. The placenta. Once fully developed, it's a disc of about 20 centimeters or so in diameter, about three centimeters thick. Uh, the surface that's facing the fetus is smooth and it's connected by the umbilical cord. Uh, the uterine surface, surface consists of villi and decidua basalis region of the endometrium. And again, it's important that you uh, to understand that the fetal and maternal blood do not mix. The conductivity or the, um, the conductivity of the blood that's distributing nutrients and um, oxygen to the fetus and the removal of carbon dioxide and waste from the fetus. So that increases as the villi grow because the membranes become thinner. So substances pass through by diffusion, facilitated diffusion. Some active transport, this is taking you back to the beginning of the course, <laughs> and receptor mediated endocytosis. So the membranes, which are unique to amniotes, are the amnion. It's a transparent sac. It's filled with fluid. Um, it protects the embryo from, from trauma. So the fluid is largely water. And as we know, water has a high specific uh, heat capacity. So it, water can be very stable um, temperature wise. So it protects the temperature from trauma, from temperature changes, um, from uh, adhering. Instead, it's, it remains uh, floating in the fluid. 
provides, provides also freedom of movement. So the embryo can grow, the fetus rather can grow and starts to uh, have limb buds and eventually of course uh, grows to a larger size with fully formed limbs. So there must be freedom of movement. Um, so this is one thing I don't really know. When, when is their first, I'm asking Jen this, when are their first noticeable signs of movement during pregnancy? Um, when does that usually happen? Usually for, for, for first time mom, it's usually around 20 weeks. Okay. And if it's subsequent pregnancy, it can be as early as 16 weeks. Okay, so 16 to 20 weeks. Okay, so there's already movement. Um, maternal plasma filtrate and fetal urine at term. The amnion contains about 700 to 1,000 milliliters of such fluid. Um, the yolk sac, it's on the ventral side of the embryo. Um, it contributes to the GI tract eventually, to blood cells and germ cells. So the yolk sac is um, a collection of cells and they're, they're very important. They end up differentiating into cells of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, into blood cells and into germ cells. And germ cells, of course, are the cells that will become the eggs and the sperm, the gametes. Um, the allantois is another membrane. It's the foundation of the umbilical cord and of the urinary bladder. The chorion is the outermost portion, the outermost membrane, and the villi form the fetal portion of the placenta. So all the membranes have very critical roles, of course. And here you can see their location. The yolk sac, the allantois, the amniotic fluid, and the chorion. Organogenesis is the formation of organs, as you could imagine, the formation of organs and organ systems. So organogenesis fo um, follows neurulation. So the formation of organs and organ systems from primary germ layers. So at eight weeks, uh, all organs are present in the three centimeter long fetus. In eight weeks, the heart is beating and the muscles exhibit uh, contractions. Derivatives of the ectoderm are such things as the epidermis, the nervous system, the lens and cornea, and the internal ear. Derivatives of the mesoderm include the skeleton. I think before I said that was the ectoderm, but it's not. Of course, the skeleton is part of the mesoderm. Uh, the muscle, cartilage, blood, lymphoid tissue, gonads, ducts, kidneys, and ureters. Um, derivatives of the endoderm are such things as the gut and respiratory epithelium, the glands, the bladder, and urethra. So organogenesis follows neurulation. Um, okay, I'm going to stop there for now. Thank you for watching.